Too low to get cows for I didn't realize that's like the house that I was wanting to rent when we first moved down here. The man wouldn't rent it to me. And they got cows there, yeah. See that? Genius, that's what it was called. It was good. It was good shit. So I've officially been on a dumb phone for over a month now, and I can firmly and confidently say that I have made the right decision, and it's not one that I intend on going back on. Because boy howdy, I am much, much less anxious since making this switch. I talked in my first video about flip phones and dumb phones, how they're less of a distraction, how they don't overwhelm you with features, how they're generally more practical to use for the things we actually need a cellular device to do. I was talking about the positives, but what I neglected to talk about, given that this much time hadn't passed, was the other mental health benefits beyond improving my attention span and making it to where I was less distracted when doing the things I needed to do. I've also found myself a lot less anxious, which is an incredible thing, because while I was not a huge user of social media, I was using it enough for the negativity that is ever present on Discord and X to seep into my life. I didn't use those platforms that much, but to the extent that I would look at them, I would end up seeing things that were unsettling, that I didn't need to see, that I frankly will not see if I'm touching grass in the real world or staying in my room doing something else that isn't on my phone. I found myself less anxious because when I used to get the urge to always be checking my phone to see if something happened on my YouTube channel, or on my email, or on Discord, I would, most of the time, not see something when I would get that urge and do that check. However, I would feel the urge nonetheless, and so I'd be doing it constantly. And so it put my brain in this mode that said, you have to always be on alert. Your device has to always be checked, because something could be happening at any point, and perhaps you could be missing out on the thing that's happening at that moment. I don't get a strong sense of FOMO in my life, but I do have hypervigilance. I don't want to miss out on things that could potentially endanger me. I want to attack them head on. I want to be ready for them. I have various anxiety disorders. And so, having a cellular device with so many different features worsened that anxiety because I thought anything could happen at any moment in the digital space and I must be tapped in as often as possible in case something does happen. So it wasn't as much about being connected with others, although sometimes I did have FOMO about being connected with others. Most of the time it was something much worse. It was more of a, something will happen to me if I don't check this thing all the time. And when you actually cut yourself off from that, when you throw your phone away and say, no, I'm not doing this anymore, I'm not going to constantly have this in my hand, I'm going to occupy my mind with something more productive, like reading a book, if I'm having free time that's not occupied by anything, if you say that, you notice your anxiety will lessen. If you do that, you notice your anxiety will lessen. And while I do have various problems with anxiety, it's not as bad as it used to be because one of the sources of that anxiety is no longer in my life. And that source was a, a cellular device. And so I can see the intersection of mental health with phones. 
because people talk about how social media gives people body image issues, about how people get self-esteem issues from social media because they think everyone has this incredible life that they don't actually have, and they feel like they have to live up to that impossible standard. They say that it's bad for the attention-related problems that I described in my other video on dumb phones, but I don't think it gets to the heart of how having a cellular device can really fuck you if you already have anxiety disorders. Because if you have OCD like myself, if you have PTSD, and if you have social anxiety, these are the three things that I have in addition to being on the autism spectrum, not a great quadruple combination to live with, I'll just tell you that. If you have all this together, these things will intersect in a terrible way with a smartphone because there is something that could always produce negative results for you. You could get a bad email. You could get a bad message that alerts you of bad things happening. You could get a bad message in general. There are so many things that you could be alerted of on the World Wide Web and when the World Wide Web is just at your fingertips then it's easy for that negative energy to control your life. But what I said is I'm going to take control of my life and I'm going to take control of my device. No longer will I have this smart device with all these different features that I don't need and that also happen to track me and that are wasting my time all the time. Where I once found myself scrolling through my phone in order to occupy empty space in my life, I am now perusing through a book or thinking about things. I'll think about things. I used to feel like I needed to always have noise playing in order to keep myself from being anxious. I couldn't spend quiet time alone. For the longest time I wasn't like this, but something changed when I entered early adulthood. Something changed where I didn't have my zen anymore where I couldn't just lay around in the quiet and be at peace. I don't know what happened, but I think it had something to do with several very traumatic events that happened around that time that worsened my PTSD. To where now, and not as much now since I've been getting off the phone, but I, I still have this problem because it's not like it, it magically goes away. But nowadays, you know, since having had those experiences, I end up muttering to myself these various words that are incoherent when I start getting anxious. I'll start screaming out in pain because a flash, a flash of something that happened to me will enter the front of my mind and I'll just see it vividly and I'll get scared. It's things like this, just my mind wandering and becoming frightened and unhappy. I haven't been addressing the problem for the longest time because I thought that an easy band-aid on the problem could be turning on the phone to play noise. Of course, I would still get the flashbacks, I would still get the anxiety and the heightened fear, but it made it a little bit more bearable. But in the process of that making it a little, a little bit more bearable, it also made it more difficult for me to spend any time alone in a room, in the quiet. And that was really bad, because I used to be someone who could sit for eight hours, nine hours, ten, doing absolutely nothing in silence and be content with it. And then I developed this overbearing anxiety that smashed all that apart. I would still see remnants of that self in my life though, like for example, whenever I've had to be on a 7 or 8 hour plane ride, I've never listened to any music or anything like that. It's just like waiting for a doctor's visit when I was growing up. You'd have to sit in the waiting room for sometimes 7 or 8 hours, and I didn't have any entertainment, I didn't have anything to do. I just sat there, and let my imagination do the talking, and I was happy to do that. And the times when I've rode on a plane in recent memory, or on a bus for that matter, 
ended up kind of bringing me back to that state because in the last couple of years, so much of my time has been occupied by this meaningless noise that I don't really enjoy, but instead have on in order to keep myself from being in silence. And without a smartphone, it's not just that I find myself in silence much more often, I also find myself appreciating it, enjoying it, being glad that I'm there. And that's how I used to be not so long ago. But I developed this addiction to the phone, and because of that addiction, all of these other problems I had ended up getting so much worse. They got so much worse because I wasn't addressing them, I wasn't actively engaging with my coping skills, I was leaning on this smart device that I didn't even like using, that was painful for me to use, that felt like it was actively making me more depressed, but I kept using nonetheless. I've broken that cycle, and I've become a much less anxious person because of it. Because of the fact that I'm not always checking the internet. Because of the fact that I'm spending more time alone thinking about things, reading books or engaging with my interests, trying to be at peace doing meditation. Meditation is very important, but the phone artificially makes it difficult to engage in. And after just a month of being off of that damn thing, I felt myself come back to a sort of normalcy. And it's been great for me, not just for all of these reasons, but also because it reminds me of someone who I used to be. I see my life in many different eras, but one of them is the pre-phone era and the post-phone era. After being 16 for a bit, I got my first ever smart device, my first ever smartphone, and prior to that, a lot of what I did was play video games, browse the internet on the computer and try to make up my own fun there, or I just went out into the woods and I would go on other people's property and try to make my own fun by playing with sticks or building things or finding animals. A lot of it was nature stuff, but you had to make a lot of things up as well. Your imagination had to be active. And I've been feeling myself closer to who I used to be since getting rid of this thing because after I got it, more of my life ended up just being hunched down in my chair, looking down at that goddamn phone. And when I go outside, anywhere, that's all I see. It's a bunch of people hunched down, looking down at their goddamn phone. And when I go outside without mine, I end up having to look at other people and to look at my environment around me instead of instinctively pulling it out in order to not have to look at anybody. Since getting rid of my smartphone, I've realized just how uncomfortable it makes me feel to look around and see that there are other people even there. I never want to look directly at anyone. I always want to have my eyes positioned somewhere as far away from other people as possible. I look out the window when I'm in a bus or on a tram, and I knew that I did these things, but the smartphone gave me a convenient excuse. Oh, I'm not doing these things because I'm so uncomfortable here. I'm, I'm doing these things because I'd really rather look at my smartphone. But no, when I go out, I'll use that device as a comfort object because I'm so uncomfortable around other people, because I'm so uncomfortable being in public. And then, you've got to ask yourself if you're in that situation, why? Why do I feel this way? Why am I having this response? And how can I address it? For me, the first step to addressing that was actually getting rid of my smartphone because no longer was I leaning on this physical device that's socially accepted to look down at in public, that's socially accepted to always be on and not be paying attention, all of a sudden, I had to pay attention because the world and I were there with nothing standing in between us. In this case, the phone was metaphorically standing in between us. And if that makes me uncomfortable, if that makes me scared as it does, I gotta own up to that reality and I gotta face it. I've got to do better if I wanna feel better. 
And doing better is not going to look like leaning on a smart device. Doing better is going to look like going out into the real world and getting experience and doing better and being a person who is comfortable in that social environment with strangers. That's where I want to be, and it's become readily apparent to me that that's not where I'm at because I got rid of this phone, and now I have to be out in those places and be as uncomfortable as I am. So that's the one-month update on living with a dumb phone. I would call it a success. Major improvements to my mental health, and there's going to be more improvements to be made because I know in no uncertain terms where my weaknesses lie. So I see this impulse that people have to compare the various elections that have recently happened around the world with the upcoming election in the US. I think that's a terrible idea for two main reasons. Because the elections that are focused on the Argentinian one and the Dutch one are about two very different regional issues that are plaguing those places that have virtually nothing to do with the issues going on in the US. Namely, inflation in the Argentinian example, they have over 140% inflation and they are reeling from a persistent economic crisis that's been going on for like over a decade now. In the Dutch example, you have virtually unmitigated, unrestricted immigration from Islamic countries uh, that is leading to a feeling of unsafety among LGBT people and women. These things that many of the, the people from those Islamic countries are doing are leading people in the Dutch population to feel as though they're unsafe and that their society is becoming increasingly less tolerant in spite of the fact that they're a country that has modeled its national identity around this broad notion of tolerance. And so these are two very different countries experiencing two very different problems, but the fact of the matter is neither of these problems is applicable to the United States. We're not having hyperinflation uh, nor are we having a decades-long economic crisis. We're also not having problems with Muslim immigration leading to, you know, things like our liberal democratic way coming into question. So you have two very different political crises happening in these two countries that you could easily learn about just by doing some basic research on the situations in those two countries. However, I think in all of the narcissism and zeal of some American pundits, there is this impulse or this instinct to compare what's going on in those nations to what's happening in the US. But the issues going on in the US could not be any more different than the issues happening in those places. My tendency to dramatically recap stories that I've already told by one, linking a few of them in the description of this video, and also by saying the important part, which is I used to go out with someone that I really didn't like who happened to have a lot of money and also happened to live in another country in an economic zone that I have dreamed about moving to since I was a young boy. The country in question that I spent many months in on multiple occasions was, in fact, Germany. And the some of the stories surrounding that I'll let you find yourself down there. But what I find to be particularly interesting about the fact that I put so much of my own resources into trying to go to that place whenever I could, uh, as well as the resources of others and, of course, this guy. Um, what I find interesting about that whole ordeal is why exactly I was doing it. 
people on this channel know that I like to travel, and they also know that I'm willing to travel on the cheap and have rough and dirty experiences if it means that I can travel in the first place. They know that I don't like being in the same place for too long, and I've attempted to reflect on why that is exactly and explain it for this channel. But more than anything, I find myself at odds with the infrastructure in my home country and the two countries that are making up the top piece of the bread and the bottom piece of the bread that is this theoretical North American sandwich, that being Mexico and Canada. Both of those countries have major issues with how they do urban planning. They're very car dependent. The U.S. itself is very car dependent. And even in the places that are not car dependent, there's still a lot of problems with the infrastructure as well as with certain aspects of the culture or federal laws that those municipalities simply can't change even if they would like to. Just all kinds of nonsense that's unique to my home country and also the two neighbors that I just mentioned. So I have a lot of problems with my continent. I have a lot of problems with my continent. And it became apparent to me at a young age that America wasn't for me. I didn't know much about Canada or Mexico. I assumed that they would mostly be the same, except that they would speak different languages and have different weather, and I was right about that. But I didn't like how my state of Tennessee looked. I remember looking out the window as a kid. I had to have been like six years old, because this is... This is as far back as, as I can remember looking out and having this general feeling of distaste for the buildings and the hedges and the cars. Don't even get me started on the cars because you've heard me go into it. Something felt so wrong. Something felt wrong about the concrete, about the automobiles moving along it, and the way that you would park your vehicle in this strange place surrounded by other vehicles just to be able to get out of it, get into the store, get like a week or two weeks worth of food in the back of your car and then drive home. And then when you would get home, it was this very isolated area apart from other people, apart from any real infrastructure, to get to any real infrastructure, you'd need to drive, and so on. Something about it, even when you were in the city, felt so isolating. Not just that, but it also felt ugly. The one saving grace was the nature that I lived around. I thought a lot of the nature was pretty, but when you got to the sprawling, empty fields, of the southeastern United States. I was not impressed. When you got to the rolling hills, sometimes I was pretty impressed, but it was a mix. The thing that I hated the most was the lawns, the hedges, the houses, and the supermarkets, the highways. Being around these things, or riding around these things, felt like this oppressive experience for me. I didn't like the idea of driving, and I certainly didn't like riding in a, in a car, but more than that, the, the infrastructure that required a, a car to facilitate movement at all, it just looked so ugly to me. And of course, I couldn't articulate it like that at that age, but I would look out at all of this stuff, and there was one way I could articulate it. It was with the word ugly. Ugly. And I said this to my parents at the time. Why is it so ugly? Why is it so ugly? And as far as I remember, there wasn't much of a response. I mean, they were 
attempts at responses, but it seemed like those around me didn't quite understand what I understood. And so I felt really alone growing up for a plethora of reasons, but I think one of the top three had to have been how alienated I was by the outside world, by the way in which the outside world was built, the infrastructure, and so on. It was alienating for me because something about it just didn't feel natural for me. Something about it just didn't click for me. Something about it felt so wrong. And even when I, many years later, got into a vehicle, got behind the wheel, and made my rounds around town, it still felt wrong. Deeply, deeply wrong. I felt alone when I was in my vehicle. I felt alone when I would go home. And I felt alone when I looked around the endless gray nothing which made up the strip malls that I would get my groceries from. Something about it felt so wrong. And something about the hedges, the lawns, the single-family homes that are somewhat spread apart from one another, but nonetheless standing in lockstep, something felt wrong about those two. And this is a sense that has only become more prominent in my life as I've gotten older. I've continued to feel this sense of alienation, but it didn't feel like something that was fully tangible for me to understand until I actually went to countries that organized their infrastructure differently. While those countries didn't have a lot of the natural beauty that I loved about the western United States or the Northeast, while it didn't have certain aspects I liked about the South, it had something much more important, which were cities that were built to live in, and transportation which connected the rural areas to said cities. It had villages of even just a couple thousand people, some of which I visited or rode past, that had trams. Or if they didn't have trams, everything was walkable. All of the infrastructure, the rural infrastructure and the urban infrastructure, was built in a way where you could live in it. And it was beautiful because of that. A world where cars are housed rather than people. A world where urban design is focused on facilitating the movement of automobiles is not a world that looks nice. And I've always been an aesthetically minded person. I think beauty is very important, and beauty has always hit me in a very visceral way. But even if I didn't have these particular beauty standards, even if I didn't care so much about that stuff, I think I would still have an understanding that this gray, ugly shit <laughs> should not be dotting every street across this country, that there should be more green space, that there should be more space to live, that people should be living with one another instead of in these realms of isolation in the suburbs. I look back now and I see so many problems I had with anxiety, being stuck in the house all day because there was nowhere to go, and when I did go somewhere, still feeling stuck because I was in a vehicle, and then exiting the vehicle to go to the store, and then still feeling stuck because the store also felt isolating. There was no one from my community there. Even if there were, they existed almost in their own little boxes. Everyone in their own little box. I don't know. I don't even know if, if I know how to articulate this because it feels so specific. It's like two different worlds. I went over to Europe by any means necessary, and I wanted to stay for as long as I could, and I kept doing that by any means necessary. And 
it hit me when I was there. It came to feel real, all of this, that these really are two different worlds, and that all of that alienation and discontent and disgust and discomfort that I felt from a young age up into adulthood, all of that was there for a reason. It's because I want to be in a place that feels like I can move around, like I can explore, like I can walk, like I can go anywhere and do anything. You don't get that with the car-centric infrastructure. What you get is this depressive haze of gray concrete and putrid green hedges. And any time I have to interface with those kinds of places, there's this little guy nibbling at the back of my head saying, please God, let me out. And if I play my cards right, if I do the right thing and become the kind of person that I want to be, maybe I will be out away from all of this, the North American nightmare. Starting to wonder if I'm potentially addicted to anxiety. Now, what do I mean by that? Today was really good. Like, I woke up around 8 a.m., the time that I normally wake up. I took my caffeine pill, which I take right away as soon as I wake up. I made breakfast for me and my wife, and I worked out after we were finished eating, and I cooked lunch later and dinner later as well, and I worked out periodically throughout the day, and that aided me in... It's so hard to think. <laughs> it's so hard to think right now when, when I'm this tired. Um, but that was actually the point that I was bridging off into. It, it aided me into this sense of calmness. You know, doing that, going through the motions with exercise, got me to feel really calm, which is how I feel right now. Although, I am so calm and warm in how I'm feeling that it's actually difficult for me to think. After doing that much exercise, I'm having trouble thinking, but I'm also feeling very tired and at peace. And I started out this video, or this clip, like, positing the question, am I addicted to anxiety? But, and I was going to bridge off into this, like, oh, you know, what do I mean by that? I, uh, I want to, I want to consume caffeine again, even though it's literally 7 p.m., and my rule is not to consume it after 12 p.m., but I figured out why I want to. <laughs> I, I answered my own question by realizing that I was asking the wrong question. What I actually want is my sense of clarity to come back. I want to be able to think clearly. I don't actually want to be anxious, but I know that if I consume caffeine this late into the day and mess up my sleep cycle, I will become anxious. So, yeah, I basically solved that one. I'm not addicted to anxiety. I just like to have energy and to think clearly. But if I think about this rationally, if I disrupt my sleep schedule, thereby worsening my sleep, I'm going to feel even more groggy and less clear mentally tomorrow. So I basically just have to go on feeling like this, which I really, really don't want to do. You know, if there's one thing that I can't stand almost more than anything in the whole world, it is not being able to think clearly and not having much energy. Okay, I feel good. <sighs> I feel relaxed, but I just have no fucking energy, man. Forgive me for having cream on my face. I apply this every morning and every night.
But I want to talk to you about yet another prescient issue, that being women with BPD and the guys who chase after them. Now, I've had the unfortunate life <laughs> of encountering a lot of these people and had the, I would argue, with hindsight in mind, hindsight is 2020 after all, uh, the even less fortunate experience tricking many of these people into believing the notion that I was in fact one of those BPD girls, thereby extracting various favors monetarily, sexually, and otherwise through them. Uh, but it was not because my act was particularly convincing, probably more than the average because I had a better memory back then, making me able to keep track of my various lies and uh, able to keep my story straight because of that. Uh, but I think it was primarily because these people really, really do not pay attention to all of the signs that it's a ruse, that they're being tricked, that nothing good is going to come out of this. And they don't see those signs, not just because they really want to believe that the person that they believe that they are helping uh, truly is having these issues, they want to believe that the person with those issues can be saved by them and them only. I believe that this interest, obsession, fetish, however you would like to put it, that so many men have with women with BPD is actually an obsession, interest, or fetish with themselves. It is not an actual infatuation with that individual. It is an infatuation with that individual insofar as that individual represents themselves, or can be a way by which, a means by which, they can export, appropriate, by, by some measure prove their worth or their value. It is, the, those people are nothing more than a means to an end. The means being the person and working out their personal issues, the end being the gratification of feeling like a better person. So it really is just an obsession with oneself. And it comes from an even deeper, more narcissistic place, which is the desire to feel like you and you only can do that. It comes from this belief in oneself that you are endowed with some special ability to save an entire person. Like, not just an entire person, that, that would be pretty egotistical to suggest in the first place, but like a person potentially experiencing a horrendous mental disorder, like an extremely serious diagnosis. The people who have these beliefs have these beliefs because they really want to see themselves as that good. And so the fetish, the obsession with the BPD women has absolutely nothing to do with the women themselves. The obsession comes from this desire to save someone. So it's, it's entirely selfish. It is an obsession with oneself. Real love, even just real infatuation, tends to come from the most authentic appreciation of one's faults, one's 
positive attributes as well, and a sincere desire to see that person grow, improve, and live a happy life. Even if that means taking the great sacrifice of removing yourself from that person's life. That's what real love looks like. It is an, an understanding that that person's happiness is your happiness, even if it means in the short term damaging oneself through loss, heartbreak, abandonment, and so on. But these people, these people don't conceive of love in that way, even if they think that they do. The quote-unquote love that they're experiencing is merely a love or infatuation with oneself because all of the problems that you believe you're fixing in that individual were only fixed because you wanted to prove to yourself that you could do it or confirm to yourself what you already thought to be true about yourself. It's a narcissistic endeavor. 